I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? The first time he said this in the film, he shot all six rounds. The second time was only five. And spoilers for the rest of this video as well. Genie joins us for some fun and magic. While enjoying a ride in the country, the mystery machine runs off the road after Fred is surprised by a woman floating alongside her motorcycle riding friends. The gang joins the group for a magical adventure in pre-revolution Iran, where danger awaits them in the form of an evil djinn. Genie was an animated series produced by Hanna-Barbera that first aired in 1973 at the same time as the new Scooby-Doo movies. It was based on the live-action series I Dream of Genie, which ran from 1965 to 1970, wherein the titular character was a wish-granting spirit of Middle Eastern origins. It's weird that she'd be depicted as a blonde Caucasian lady, and while the traditional understanding is that her master would be limited to just three wishes, that isn't the case here as Genie was able to perform magic for her master at will. The live-action version of Genie was played by Barbara Eden, but she does not voice the animated character. Instead, that role is assumed by Julie McWhorter. They also made Genie a redhead for some reason, though it's not like that hair color is common for the region either. Unlike the original series, instead of a NASA astronaut who found her bottle after a splashdown, Genie's animated master is teenager Corey Anders, played by Mark Hamill in his first ever voiceover role, as well as his first appearance in the Scooby-Doo franchise. Anders is accompanied by his best friend Henry Glob, voiced by the late Bob Hastings. This pairing would become very interesting years later as Hamill's most celebrated voiceover role would be Joker on Batman the Animated Series, where Hastings voiced Commissioner Gordon. And now we come to this guy. Oh, I thought it was coleslaw. And like you dig standing in coleslaw? Only when I can't find pickles. Ugh. Because the producers decided Jeannie and her friends needed a comic relief character, they created Babu, an apprentice djinn who Jeannie had been mentoring for over one and a half millennia. Babu was voiced by Joe Besser, possibly most famous for his brief run with the Three Stooges after the death of Shemp Howard. Look, this episode is going to be a particularly rough one for me. I've always hated Jabberjaw and Pee Wee from the Smurfs. I love Frank Welker. He is Zeus in the pantheon of voiceover gods. But Jabberjaw and Pee-wee are two of Welker's characters with personas that are like gnarled, infected, ingrown toenails scraping down the blackboard of my brain and they just make me want to curl up and die of terminal, rage-induced cringe. Babu is if Jabberjaw and Pee-wee were trapped in one of Dr. Brundle's telepods while Steve Urkel was using it. Every time he is on screen makes me nostalgic for when I was deafened by a horrible ear infection. Babu's entire shtick seems to be nothing more than wearing a fez, eating, and getting his master into trouble by doing something stupid. Wait. Why does that sound... familiar? Mystery in Persia is often considered the first occurrence in the Scooby-Doo franchise of real supernatural activity. Provided we discount all the times in previous episodes where unexplained things happen, like pudgy museum curators being able to toss objects weighing several hundred pounds like they were made of cardboard, or middle-aged farmers carrying giant stalagmites like groceries. And of course, we shouldn't forget that the Adams Family episode also featured real supernatural elements like Gomez literally walking up walls, living statues, and especially Thing, who is a sentient, disembodied hand. It's Genie! <laughs> and those two on the bike are Corey and Henry. Speaking of the Adams Family, the way the gang immediately know who Jeannie and her friends are is reminiscent of how they recognized Gomez, Morticia, and the rest when they met those guest stars. However, in that episode, it's explained that the Adams Family was a television show featuring the real Adams characters who really existed in the Scooby-Doo universe. There's no explanation given here how the gang know Jeannie, Corey, and Henry. It's not like those three were celebrities in their TV series. Those two must be in love. Oh, yes. Especially you, Scoob. <laughs> We're gonna have to do something about Scooby. 
Scooby is apparently going to fall in love with all the cute guest stars, though I'm not sure what he sees in Jeannie. She doesn't even have a belly button. In this episode, the villain is Abdullah, the Grand Vizier of the Persian Kingdom of Zendat, ruled by his nephew Prince Avin. Abdullah is plotting to usurp the throne by employing the powers of a genie to get rid of the rightful sultan. Wait. Why does that sound... familiar? You see, it is the custom of my country that before he may inherit the title of sultan, a prince must rule from this palace for one year without leaving. Prince Aben says he will not be able to officially assume the role as sultan until he spends a year ruling Zendat without leaving the castle. In real life, Iran had been ruled since the 1940s by a brutal dictator, who was called a shah and not sultan, until being deposed by a revolution a little over four years from when this episode aired. Prince Aben was probably voiced by John Walmsley, who starred on the Walton's television series mentioned briefly in my previous video. I say probably because sometimes it's difficult to pin down who did what voices on older animated series because back then the producers couldn't care less about properly crediting their talent. I must say though, whoever did voice Aben was just terrible. I mean, listen to this delivery. How do you find your way around, Aben? It's not easy, and the entire palace is honeycombed with secret passages, which even I don't know. I may shit on the new Scooby-Doo movies, and the series deserves it. But one of the show's few saving graces is that the voice acting is still good for the most part. But not here. If this was Walmsley, he sounds like a bored teenager whose turn it was to read out loud in high school English class. Abdullah's entire scheme consisted of recycling the premise from A Night of Fright is No Delight, only instead of scaring away the rightful heirs to a fortune in cash before they could satisfy the instructions of an eccentric millionaire's will, here it's scaring away the rightful sultan before he can satisfy the instructions of an eccentric script. I have a message from the great Haji, master of all genies. What is the message? He wants you to go to Persia. There's a prince called Aben who is a great, 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 Great great grandson of the old 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 Babu. Okay, okay. He was a very old friend. <laughs> Never I... mind, Babu. I have received the message. Haji, he himself imprisoned me in this bottle ten thousand years ago. There is a legend that many thousands of years ago an ancestor of mine caused an evil jinn to be imprisoned in a bottle and sealed in these walls. At first, I thought this was a discrepancy because Jadal said the great Haji personally imprisoned him in the bottle. But then Prince Aben claimed an ancestor was responsible. Wouldn't having the great Haji as a distant relative make Aben a jinn himself? And if so, couldn't he do magic? However, if you listen to Aben's exact words, he said an ancestor caused an evil jinn to be imprisoned in a bottle. This would allow for Aben's relative to have been responsible for Jal being locked up, but not personally having done so. In fact, as recounted by Babu, the reason the great Haji sent Genie to Iran in the first place was to help the descendant of an old friend. There's definitely a backstory somewhere here of an ancient Persian sultan being terrorized by an evil magic user. Wait. Why does that sound... familiar? Hey. Wait, one little minimum. Genie, why can't we all go to Persia? Passports, visas, immunization records, traveler's insurance. Do you hear, Chattel? I hear, Master. The great Haji sends this mere wisp of a genie against you. Ten minutes into the episode and we already know who the villains are. I can't understand why the producers got rid of any possible mystery in the episode by showing Abdullah and the evil jinn together so early on. Indeed, the more you think about this scene, the more baffling it becomes. Why in the hell is Abdullah here now in the United States watching over Genie and the rest? Did he have Jadal magically send him to wherever anyone who might be a danger to his plot happens to be in the world? That can't be the case, because Jadal only appeared from the bottle after Abdullah overheard Babu giving Genie the instructions from the Great Haji. Where's Persia? They call it Iran now. 
this episode aired a little over four years before it would suddenly become extremely dangerous for a group of American teenagers to visit that country. Or for Jeannie to wear an outfit like that. As for whether Abdullah's plan was worth it is up for debate. On the one hand, ruling a country would appeal to a lot of people, and having as your slave an all-powerful magical being capable of granting wishes would make the chances of winning seem all but guaranteed. On the other hand, why bother ruling just one country when you have as your slave an all-powerful magical being capable of granting wishes? If you can have literally anything you want, why not just be rich with an immortal body? You'd have all the power of a king, but none of the responsibilities. I suppose we can chalk this up to how some people are just psychotic enough to want to run everything, despite having enough money to be happy doing anything they want without having to bother others. It's also possible Abdullah set his sights so low because he was aware of the great Haji, master of all genies, and if the Grand Vizier stepped too far out of line, a power much stronger than Jadal might appear to take him out. Incidentally, while the great Haji never appears in person, just to avoid any confusion, we're talking this guy and not this guy. Although that Haji is pretty awesome. Abdullah's plan was worth pursuing, and the risk of getting caught was extremely low considering he had access to someone with the ability to bend the laws of time and space. You can't design a scheme more likely to succeed than that. So I'm giving him a 4 out of 5. I still dinged him a point for his plot, not being that original. This is one of the few Scooby-Doo episodes that didn't feature any disguises worn by the bad guys. The closest they came was when a veiled sheik stalked Shaggy, Scooby, and Babu, but neither villain was inside the white robes, so it was ultimately just a prop. Ditto for everything else in the episode that was meant to frighten anyone, including the unmanned opening gate, wailing voice, and magic mirror. With no outfit to rate... I'm stuck giving Abdullah and Jadal a neutral 2.5 out of 5. Why didn't Abdullah simply wish for the throne from Jadal? Why go through all that hassle of pretending to support his nephew, keeping the evil jinn hidden, and scaring away the residents of the castle? All he would have to do was say, Jadal, I wish to be sultan. And poof. No muss, no fuss. Failing to do what should have been the most obvious thing in the world set Abdullah up for failure. And nothing he or Jadal could do in the episode would change that fact. What's up? What's up? Probably just the wind. Right, Velma? Right, Daff? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, I'm in it! Of course you're in it, dum-dum. That's why it's called a mirror. I was in the mirror, but it wasn't me. Oh, boy. Corey, you literally travel the world with someone who can use magic. And in all that time, you have seen some crazy things. Why is it so hard for you to accept that your friend saw something odd in the mirror? This episode shares a few similarities with the previous Globetrotters episode. In both, the main characters arrive at an empty location try their best to fall asleep despite weird things happening, and end up falling down a chute hidden under their beds to a locked room. At least this time, all the typical shenanigans that the writers would normally leave unexplained in the new Scooby-Doo movies can be waved away as actual supernatural phenomenon. Though I question why an evil Jim wanting revenge would resort to what were essentially just pranks. <laughs> Yikes! When Babu splits, he really splits! He's still there! Why would a djinn chase his victims like this? Wouldn't it have been a lot easier just to use his magic? It's not like Babu could have stopped him. Babu. If I had all that magical power and escaped being trapped in a cramped bottle for 10,000 years, I would be exploding heads left and right. Of course, the magic that bound me in the bottle would have forced me to obey whoever released me, so is it any wonder that jinns have a habit of twisting wishes into the worst possible meaning of the words? 10,000 years alone would give you a lot of time to come up with ironic punishments for masters who make the standard wishes for wealth, love, and immortality. Give you a billion dollars? Sure! But since you didn't specify how and where, enjoy being squished flat by 300 tons worth of pennies. Make every woman in the world fall in love with you? 
Nice one, master. Too bad you forgot your mom is a woman, too. A body that never dies? I can do that. Whoops. Now who left that hole that opens directly to the center of the earth right there under your feet? Bia Inja! Let me out! Let me out! Gladly! In ten thousand years! Instead, Jadal's worst act is trapping Genie in another bottle to lock her up for ten thousand years. But he kept it in a spot where anyone could stumble over it. Oh, hey, it's the return of Scooby's superpower. Vinny! Oh, Scooby, you saved me! <laughs> Wait a minute. If Scooby rescued Jeannie from her bottle, wouldn't that make him her new master? Did you think the great Haji would send a messenger who did not know your tricks? Wait a minute. Why is Genie able to overpower Jadal now when he trapped her in a bottle so easily before? Ultimately, Abdullah failed to properly use his magical servant and chose a needlessly convoluted method of trying to steal his nephew's throne. Despite the phenomenal cosmic power normally afforded beings like Jadal, Scooby and the rest were never shown to be in real physical danger. In fact, the most harm done to anyone in the episode was when the three gluttons here almost accidentally poisoned themselves. You call this soup? No, sir. They call it soup. I call it laundry. <laughs> the Scooby writers never get tired of that gag, do they? I'm giving Abdul and Jadal a 1 out of 5 for their operation. This is easily the worst any Scooby villain has ever blown their chance for success that I've seen in the franchise so far. This leaves the evil Grand Vizier and his magical servant with a final do score of 2.5 out of 5. Well, tell us. I would, but I I'm so hungry my brain isn't working too good. I don't think food will help that. <laughs> Velma has always been just a little bit of a snarky asshole, hasn't she? Persians are famous for their hospitality. Uh? I want to look good. <laughs> good night, Romeo. Henry must have memorized the script because he was mouthing Corey's lines. Wait, I'm getting a vibration from my master. Wow. That might have come close to Daphne's panty shot when it comes to the producers knowing exactly what they were doing. There! They must be somewhere in that pyramid. Iran doesn't have pyramids like that. They do have ziggurats, which are closer to the step pyramids of South America than the more famous ones found in Egypt. Oh, Scooby. It's cool. Scooby is sentient. He understands English and can even speak, albeit with a bit of a speech impediment. Ordinarily, when a dog licks someone, it's dismissed as just a behavioral trait of the animal. Dogs lick to show affection, or to bond with their owner, or even to show they're stressed out. But we know that Scooby has a crush on Genie, and here he is essentially doing the dog version of making out with her, and no one says anything about that. If Shaggy ran up to Genie and started licking her, I doubt she would have shrugged it off. This is one of those times if you really stop to consider the ramifications of a dog like Scooby, it can border on the disturbing. No, Scooby, not in that one! There's oil in there! Really? Really indeed. At least Shaggy learned his lesson from the last time he and Scooby hid in barrels of goo. Though it is a bit odd that the producers used olive oil instead of petroleum oil, considering Iran is a major exporter of the latter. That country didn't become known for commercially exporting the former until the 1990s. Ooh. Yeah. I don't smell anything. You heard what the djinn said. Could I be less brave than a female? Jesus Christ! Fucking 1970s! Yevil devil! <laughs> 
that's funny. The outside looks just like the inside. Thelma, that bottle, may I see it? Sure, isn't it a beauty? I bet it's a thousand years old. Ten thousand. Human civilization itself isn't even 10,000 years old, let alone ceramics. Of course, we're dealing with mythical beings in the first place, so when it comes to genies and the like, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief and assume they come from a magical prehistoric age, like how Conan the Barbarian lived in Hyperborea over 10,000 years ago, or even the world of Middle-earth created by J.R.R. Tolkien taking place long, long before Europe was a thing. Because your father was a fool who believed in ruling by love, I would have ruled as a sultan should rule, with force. Well, in real life... Well, they're at it again. Don't you guys ever learn? Got a cold there, Fred? You mean this time it's not laundry? Oh, no! Not laundry! This time it's soap! Mm -hmm. No, I guess they really don't get tired of that gag. Yapple dapple! 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 Today, Scooby and the gang meet Tim Conway. The gang visit Velma's hometown for a benefit sports show at her old high school's brand new stadium. Unfortunately, they learn it's being haunted by the ghost of a sports legend, and the recently hired celebrity coach needs their help to save the event and his job. The late Tim Conway was a renowned comedic television and movie actor, often paired with another Scooby-Doo icon, Don Knotts while older viewers would best remember his work on television series like The Carol Burnett Show and two of his own self-named shows in the 1970s and 1980s, younger ones would recognize his voice as Barnacle Boy from SpongeBob SquarePants. The studio was planning a movie on the life of Coach Newt Rockney, and they turned you down as the star? Yeah, ridiculous, isn't it? My agent said I could get that part of the coach if I lived like one. So, I became a coach here. In this episode, Conway has temporarily left Hollywood to assume the position of the athletic coach at Velma's old high school as research for a potential film role. Unfortunately for him, he can't escape his naturally bumbling nature and spends most of the episode involved in pratfalls and buffoonery. Cool it, you two. We're going back to my old high school for the All Sports Day benefit show. Wait a minute. Didn't Velma go to the same high school as the rest of the gang? She's 15 years old canonically, which means she's probably at least a freshman. Did she originally meet the rest of the gang outside of school? Or did she only attend her old high school for a semester or two before transferring? We came all the way here to help raise funds for my old alma mater, and no spirit's gonna spook us. She's technically correct, but generally speaking, alma mater usually refers to the school from which you actually graduated. I don't understand why Velma feels so indebted to a school she could not have attended for more than a year. Who, who are you? Jess Fenster, the school custodian. No, I'm pretty sure you're Stephen King. Jesse Finster, the school custodian, and Griffith, the identical twin brother of the school's principal, intended to turn the stadium into a racetrack for gambling. So to purchase the property cheaply, they decided to sabotage... Sabotage. How? When? The Benefit Sports Show by dressing up as the ghost of a former student athlete. This show was the last hope of the school to remain open due to having run out of operating funds. Unfortunately, as neither the principal nor his brother was given a first name in the episode, discussing them could possibly lead to some confusion. Therefore, unless otherwise stated, 
just assume any time I mention Griffith, I'm talking about the evil twin and not the principal. Remember me? Velma? Have we met? Sure. You were principal when I went to school here. Oh, yes. Welcome back. Yes, I'm sure Mr. Griffith would have no problem remembering literally every single one of the thousands of students that would have passed through his school during the course of his decades-long career. Oh, yeah. Velma Dinkley. You were the smug little know-it-all that all the teachers dreaded getting in their class. Boy, were we all glad when you moved away. All kidding aside, this is likely the principal's evil twin brother here having already taken over the school, and this line about not remembering Velma was probably meant to be foreshadowing the later reveal about the switch. While it is a tried and true method for Scooby villains to use scare tactics to convince an owner to sell his property, stealing an already built stadium to convert to a gambling location is unique. Though I question whether a public school would be allowed to close, considering local children would still need somewhere to be supplied a government-mandated education. Sadly, though, this is not a deal-breaker for Finster and Griffith's scheme, because it's not unheard of for communities to lose their schools if the area is too poor to support one via property taxes or philanthropic donations. When it shuts down, those poor kids can look forward to long bus rides to the nearest community that can support a high school. Of course, Velma's alma mater could be a private institution, which would go a long way toward explaining why it was running out of funds and needed donations to continue. However, here's why I'm comfortable assuming it's a public school. As seen by the route taken by the mystery machine at the beginning of the episode, this appears to be a small town rather than a mid-sized or large city. While it's not unheard of for tiny communities to have private schools, that's not the norm. Or rather, when such a rural setting does have a private school, it's usually a religious one. And I didn't see any crosses anywhere in the episode. The idea that a school stadium would be replaced with a racetrack sounds even more probable in today's political environment that seems indifferent and even hostile to public education. Worse, the obvious amount of profit that would be reaped through gambling and the ancillary businesses that would crop up to support it would make it even more likely that local government officials wouldn't try that hard to investigate the circumstances behind the school's closure. I'm giving the villains a design score of 5 out of 5. Their plan was unique, profitable, and not likely to have the authorities ask that many questions if successful. While this wasn't the first time that multiple villains wore the same disguise, this is the first time the gang has encountered one based on the ghost of a high school sports star. Fireball McFane was allegedly a 1940s student athlete who swore revenge after being disqualified from a sporting event, having been caught cheating by Velma's old principal. I say allegedly because the only ones telling the story of McFane are the custodian and fake principal. So it's conceivable that the two of them simply made up the story of the disgraced athlete seeking vengeance from beyond the grave. Well, now that you have witnessed the great Fireball McFane, what do you think? What do I think? I think you look a little too old to be a high school student, Mr. McFane, sir. Of course, just because McFane swore revenge while in high school doesn't mean he had to have died at that age. He could have lived for another ten years nursing that grudge, and returned to his old school to terrorize it after succumbing to a stress-induced heart attack. Then again, it's just as likely that the Scooby artists were instructed to design an athlete from the 1940s and were never told the guy was supposed to be a teenager. The more I think about it, the more likely it was that the entire McFane story was invented by the two villains. Velma didn't act like she knew the story, which would be unlikely if she'd been a student at the school. People gossip, and even kids learn about many of the skeletons in their teachers' closets, so it's unlikely that an awesome story about a disgraced athlete wouldn't be shared with incoming freshmen. And if Fireball McFane had been a real individual, he'd be in his late 40s to early 50s by this point. It wouldn't take that much effort to look in the local phone book for anyone named McFane and place a call. Of course, that'd only work if McFane was still living in the area, but trust me, the man peaked in high school. There's no way he wouldn't still be living in his small hometown. Finster and Griffith employed the standard movie projectors to simulate the ghost of Fireball McFane appearing all over the stadium to chase the gang, but the villains took this a step further. Not only did they have multiple ghosts appear at the same time, but they would occasionally just use the head, which added to the eeriness of the phony haunting. Nobody! 
nobody will ever play sports in this stadium again. <laughs> <laughs> It's got a twin! Not only did the projectors keep the gang guessing where the ghost would appear, they also allowed the villains themselves an easy escape after physically interacting with their victims, a classic misdirection worthy of a talented magician. Incidentally, regardless of whether that's Finster or Griffith in disguise right now, he just popped that football like a grape, and that's never going to be explained. I'm not sure an elderly man like Griffith could handle the rigors of pretending to be a teenage sports star, nor does Finster appear to have the same physique as the ghost. These are just two minor quibbles, though, considering how little the producers seem to care about the laws of physics in these episodes. The spirit of Fireball McFane satisfied all the conditions of a good Scooby villain. He was original, scary, and had convincing special effects. Five out of five for the outfit. With perfect design and outfit scores, how well did Finster and Griffith execute their scheme? Well... Mistake number one was kidnapping Griffith's brother, the principal. If the goal was scaring people away from the school and sinking the benefit sports event, this was an unnecessary step that just complicated things for the villains. The school was already in financial trouble, as implied by the fact that it had already been bailed out once by rich benefactor Jay Teller. A small school can't operate without outside financial aid. Wow. Sounds like they're in Texas. Remember our dilapidated old stadium here? Before Teller built the ultra-modern one you see today. They're definitely in Texas. You failed to produce a champion sports team, and now you've canceled the benefit show. I'll have to discontinue my grants to the school. With Teller already complaining about the school not having kept its end of the bargain by producing a championship team, he would have been unlikely to keep the place afloat again. If Finster and Griffith had succeeded in buying out the school and stadium, what would they have done with their prisoner? Letting him go would be dangerous under normal circumstances, because obviously Principal Griffith would immediately report his abduction to the police, who would undoubtedly include the recent sale of the stadium in their investigation. But in this case, it would be even more suspicious after the sale of the stadium. Put yourself in Principal Griffith's shoes. Even if he never saw or heard his kidnappers and had no clue as to their identity, once he found out that someone who looked exactly like him had been running the school all the time he was bound and gagged, he would obviously suspect his identical twin brother. There's no way Griffith the villain would have been able to hide his involvement. Was Griffith planning on murdering his twin? That would have made for some awkward Thanksgiving dinners. Also, they kept Principal Griffith tied up in the stadium where anyone could find him. Are there no Scooby villains smart enough to hide their kidnapping victims somewhere that's not at the scene of the crime? Like a remote storage locker or abandoned basement somewhere? Of course! The locker! Just as I suspected, a secret passage. Not anymore, it isn't. I'm usually fine whenever the gang run into hidden passageways in old mansions and castles, or anywhere that a villain could conceivably build one themselves. But this is a brand new sports stadium, and the plans for which likely would have had to have been approved by any number of city planners or engineers, especially for a public high school. The builders couldn't have put in that secret tunnel, secret tunnel. without somebody asking some questions, and even if Finster and Griffith did it themselves, there's no way at least one person wouldn't have noticed the villains installing a secret passage behind the lockers. Free down, free to go. <laughs> now what do you suppose that meant? Yeah! Or a trapdoor for that matter. Again, new stadium. Even if you could convince them to build a secret passageway to the basement, what builder in his right mind would be willing to install a dangerous trapdoor in a school setting? Surely that would open them up to liability if anyone got hurt. Don't call me Shirley. Everybody okay? I'll let you know when I know where we are. I'll let you know now. It's an underground cavern. Wait a minute. They built a high school stadium over a cavern? Wouldn't there have been land studies prior to construction to make sure the ground was stable enough to support a structure of that size? It's no go. Solid steel and lock. 
But there must be a way out. Not through here. Isn't that the lock right there? It looks like it's just a bar, not even padlocked. Can't they just lift it up and open the door? When Finster and Griffith discovered that the gang were trapped in their secret cavern under the stadium, did they think that was it? Were they planning on letting their captives starve to death, assuming they couldn't get out? Good grief, this is no time to be playing games. If I was Velma, instead of looking for clues about the ghost, I'd be looking for clues as to where my lower half disappeared. Maybe Babu is lurking around somewhere nearby. Oh god, I hope not. F***ing Babu the genie. That gadget must be a clue. It's more than that. It's a remote control device for the bulldozer. Who designed that remote? Radio Shack? There's only four buttons. I guess you're screwed if you want to turn left or right. <laughs> now I'm behind by a tail. Shaggy, I think you're onto something. I mean this model racetrack. It almost looks like the school and stadium. The cavern was obviously a location the two villains were still in the middle of using for their scheme, as evidenced by their stadium model and the construction equipment down there. Did they assume it would never occur to their prisoners to use the bulldozer to smash their way out? Which is what happened? It's like the end of every A-Team episode where the bad guys locked up Hannibal and the rest in a warehouse where there was always enough stuff conveniently lying around with which they could use to escape. Before concluding my discussion of Finster and Griffith's operation score, I want to briefly discuss two unanswered questions left by the episode. You're not the same custodian I remember when I was here. Oh, you mean old Clemens? Well, miss, he, uh, disappeared quite suddenly. First of all, a high school large enough to support a massive sports stadium would definitely employ several custodians, and it would be unlikely for most students to know them all. But setting that aside, the dialogue here implies that the original custodian that Velma remembers, Clemens, was dealt with by Finster. I presume this was so Finster could more easily take over the custodian position for easier access to the school, however Clemens is never mentioned again in the episode. Did he legitimately leave the school after being frightened away, or was he murdered by Finster and Griffith? We never find out. That's our job, mystery solving. You mean trouble causing. And I'm going to see that you're stopped, one way or another. Ordinarily, the innocent third suspect in a Scooby episode is usually an undercover detective, and when they try to ward off the gang, it's to keep them safe. That's not the situation here. Teller isn't a cop and has no vested interest in shutting down the stadium. But here, he's acting sinister for no reason. Ultimately, Finster and Griff... <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Ultimately, Finster and Griffith's biggest mistake had to have been trying to scare away the gang in the first place. I know I've said this before, but often if a Scooby villain just laid low, their plan would have worked without doing anything. Fred, Daphne, and Vilma live for chasing ghosts. Popping up in front of them wearing a mask is like smiling in front of a vampire after you just flossed your teeth for the first time in months. And did Griffith forget he was pretending to be the principal? Thank the kids for their concern, and then tell them to f*** off. It's not that difficult. You're the authority figure. The gang loves authority figures. And then while you're at it, fire Tim Conway. Even if you ignore the fact that he is obviously less qualified to coach high school sports than I am to offer dieting tips to Jonah Hill, there's no players left to coach in the first place. Again, it's a no-brainer. This is so frustrating because Finster and Griffith were heading toward greatness with their perfect design and outfit scores. Two out of five for the operation. They just couldn't stick the landing. This leaves the two villains with a final new score, a four out of five. I suppose that's still impressive, especially for the new Scooby-Doo movies. Okay, okay, if you insist. <laughs> 
<laughs> Worst dog owners ever. We're not the only ones. Look. Yikes. That guy's not even on the road. Velma reminds me just a little bit of Call Me Chris. Let's get that driver's license number. How? Nobody was driving it. Ghost! Give it a few decades, Shaggy and Scooby. Then you'll have a real reason to be afraid of driverless vehicles. Three, the stadium haunted by a real live ghost. He's in here. Quiet. Dogs can't talk. Well, someone just came right out and said it. If we could somehow get rid of that ghost. With a bunch of kids and a dog. And a coach. Huh, some coach. For a millionaire, he's kind of a dick. It's so weird for a rich guy to be that rude. Don't worry, team. That spirit will never spot us in here. So, they think they can hide from the spirit of Fireball McFane. Gosh, who could the mystery figure wearing the overalls possibly be? Whoa! I know we shouldn't expect television to teach our children science, but how many of us growing up thought anything we filled with air should float because of cartoon moments like this? I know I was one of those kids. Wait a minute. This was obviously a projected image and not one of the real villains. He should have passed right through the netting. 40! 45! You're out! So are we! Let's scram! There are clearly still baseballs in the hopper. Sorry, Fireball. Yeah, you might say you got canned. <laughs> if it wasn't for cartoon physics, a fall from that height with that velocity should have killed the bad guy. Would Shaggy and Scooby still be laughing when they lift the lid later and find what looks like 10 gallons of ravioli at the bottom of the can? See, this is movie history. We're looking at a ghost scream test. Not even the laugh track thought that was funny. Nothing here but a mock-up of a school. Hold it. Hmm. A racehorse on a school track? The sports show is bound to be a success with our world's two greatest athletes. I love how Hanna-Barbera saved a buck here by using the same plate for the stadium model that the gang found in the villain's hideout as the actual stadium at the end of the episode. You can tell by how the spectators in the stands are identical. And right now, I feel red hot. Gee, I thought you didn't smoke. I don't, but I am. Actually, in real life, Tim Conway had been a smoker. And that's my ranking of the villains from the second set of episodes of the second season of the new Scooby-Doo movies, shown here along with the ones from my previous video. We've reached the halfway point in the season and have found at least one high-ranking bad guy. Who knows what the remaining four episodes will give us. Hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'm hoping to hit 5,000 subscribers any day now, so if you haven't already done so, why haven't you done so?